All right, folks, um, we're going to go ahead and get started. I have a uh, co-conspirator from MAST who should be joining us uh, shortly, again, because the links all got mixed up. Um, <laughs> I, I think he'll he'll be just a minute behind me. Um, and indeed, yes. So today's, today's lesson um, is going to be a little bit different from the others. I know traditionally uh, we've done, I've done live coding and you follow it along. Today is going to be a lot of talking. It's kind of more of a lecture. You're welcome to follow along uh, and run the cells. But uh, in reality, we're going to be focusing a little bit on the, um, the, the the concepts themselves rather than a lot of the code that I'm doing. You know, as, as always, you're encouraged to come back in and examine that. Um, and the materials will remain available to you after the class. So I think uh, <laughs> based on based on the crowd, uh, I see only familiar names, so I don't know that introductions are entirely necessary. Uh, I am uh, Thomas Dukevich, your your host for all of these. Um, thank you for for showing up to all all six of these. I, I think the names in the chat have been here for us, so it's uh, it's wonderful to see you all again. Um, I also have a, a co-conspirator with me tonight from from Mast uh, who might want to do a, a quick introduction. Hi, yes, I'm Arjun Saval. I'm a rising fifth year astronomy grad student at the University of Maryland College Park, and I've been lucky enough to work with Thomas this summer and last summer on developing Tyke content. So I'm here. If you have any questions over the course of the next hour, feel free to pop them in the chat while Thomas is lecturing, and I can hopefully answer them quickly. Uh, amazing. Thanks, Arjun. Uh, so it's it's always good to have some backup on these. Um, so with that, we are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, there is uh, there's a bit of setup that we're going to do for this one. We've been using the default uh, type image, and when I say image, I mean like a it, it's really a Docker container, but the set of software, right? The set of installed software for this. We're using some special customized packages, uh, and so we're going to actually have to install those onto your machines. The instructions for that are located in today's directory. So uh, again, you should be dropped into into the type content. Um, if you go under notebooks, webinar series, you know the drill. Um, 05 dash statistics. There's a lot of files in here today. What you'll need to do um, if you start with readme.txt. Uh, that has the three separate instructions that you need to run. And actually to run those, what you'll do is click this uh, plus button up here, and that opens up this, this menu uh, from which you can select a terminal. So if you select a terminal, uh, notice also, and it I did not pick up on this right away, the directory that you're in when you click this plus button is the directory that this terminal will point at. Um, so I know it's hard to see because I'm, I'm so zoomed in, but this path that I'm in, right? I'm in webinar series 05. Um, the terminal actually gets opened in that path. So it's both convenient, but you also have to make sure you pay attention to that because otherwise you might end up somewhere uh, you don't want to be. Uh, but anyway, so if if you go to the readme, there's, there's three instructions. This first one is to uh, create a Kana environment from uh, the YAML file that we have. And you can just copy paste that into the terminal. Uh, this next one will actually activate the environment. And then this third command will make that environment available to the notebooks. Now that's going to take a second to run while all that installs. Uh, while you're doing that in the meantime, I just uh, want to want to uh, make you aware that this environment will not persist. Uh, so after the installation is done, if you log out of Tyke, uh, shut down your server. When you log back in, this will be cleared out. This is actually partially intentional. Uh, uh, the the way that we have this uh, set up. If you want to create a persistent environment, one that will stay every time you log in, there are some newly updated instructions. Uh, so again, the introduction. This is where you land. Uh, if you click on how do I install extra software, uh, you'll see this set of instructions here. Um, which I thought I had updated earlier, but I, I actually looked into it and, and uh, it turns out I was pointing at the old ones. Uh, the file name was not correct, uh, but at any rate, it's it's in there now. So if you click on this, how do I install extra extra software? Um, you will get the latest and greatest instructions. Um, 
which will create both an environment that persists uh, and one which uh, is available to the notebooks. So just for future reference, you know, you're welcome to create your own uh, software environments for your particular use case, whatever it may be. Unless you are mining Bitcoin, uh, then don't create one for that. <laughs> we, that is the <laughs> probably the one thing you cannot do on this platform. And we do we do monitor that. Um, but at any rate, so I'll give folks just a second to continue installing this. I know that this is something different. We haven't done this before. Oh, and as, as folks are installing, you might notice that this notebook yelled at you about the kernel. Um, it's it's waiting for you to create this Celerite docs one. Um, so if you don't already have that and you tried to open the notebook, it probably it probably was quite uh, quite aggravated about that. Today's lesson, rotation rate statistics, is a direct follow up to lesson four, which was about flaring rates when compared to rotation rates. Our objectives today are to fit a Gaussian process to uh, rotating stars light curves. So this will be our sample from before. We're going to try to understand how to apply Bayesian statistics uh, to astrophysical problems. We'll use those statistics to look at population level trends. And we're also going to use Python code accelerators just for fun. Uh, and the accelerators in question is, is actually just Numba. Uh, it is a great package. I actually use it in my own research, and it just makes things very fast. Uh, if you want to quickly analyze 10,000 light curves and you just need the, the uh, you know, something blazing fast, it's, it's a great thing to do. I personally think it's an excellent balance between the flexibility and user friendliness of Python uh, with the speed of C. And in fact, that's actually what Numba does behind the scenes. It, it bypasses the, the Python compiler um, and it does just in time compilation um, using, you You have to use uh, NumPy things so that, so that you can get access to these C functions, but it, it runs through that and it's just, it's incredibly fast. It's remarkable how much improvement you can get with uh, very little work. So it's super cool package. We'll We'll see it later in this notebook. For context, or I guess for a refresher, uh, in our previous notebook, we, we walked through the steps of trying to determine a relationship between the rotation rate and the flaring rate of our M dwarf population. But the method that we used, namely Lom Scargill, uh, didn't produce any formal errors, which leaves us with a couple of questions, or should leave us with a couple of questions. One, what is the uncertainty on the trend that we derived? And two, what is the significance? So, you know, these kind of going uh, hand in hand. And we want to think specifically, right? Is there is our model actually good? Can our is our data actually um, distinguishable from from no correlation at all? And in this notebook, we're gonna we're gonna walk through the modeling to answer the above questions. Uh, some prerequisites that I think everybody's familiar with. We've written plenty of functions. We talked about Stella. Everybody here did the last notebook. Good to go. Import statements. NumPy, matplotlib, light curve should be familiar. Uh, Seaborn we're going to use to make precisely one plot. Uh, Numba I just talked about ad nauseum. Super cool. Check it out. Uh, the other packages, uh, Celerite, PyMC, and, and Arbiz are for the Gaussian process that work, the Gaussian processes that we're going to create in this notebook. So uh, those, those will be new. I'm going to go ahead and run this first cell. If you get an error, please do put it in the chat. Uh, I had to, oh, good, I got an error. Uh, what's the issue? <laughs> um, this environment that I have given to you all uh, is supposed to install all of the packages that you need. This is kind of like playing whack-a-mole. I have found that every single time that I install this, it, it decides that it needs something else. Uh, but easy peasy, if you run into this error as well, whatever module it says you don't have, copy paste that. Uh, you can visit your terminal window. Do make sure you're in the... Um, so sorry, do make sure you're in the terminal window, not that says uh, test, which is the default, but in the one that you hopefully just activated that says uh, Celerite docs. Um, you can always do a, a Honda activate if need be. Uh, so I'm just gonna paste that name and do a quick pip install. 
part of the reason uh, why it's doing this is because we have dependency resolution turned off, uh, because if you don't turn it off, it is going to try to uh, resolve packages, which actually aren't all that compatible with each other. Uh, and so, unfortunately, that does leave us in this in this whack-a-mole type situation. So there might be another packager. Oh, great. That was it. It just wanted that one. Um, it's been very fussy today. I also do want to underscore, uh, this is why we had those pre-configured environments for you. And again, those pre-configured environments can't do everything. That's why we are creating a new one. Uh, but there is value in, in uh, having those as, as standards. And a lot of our notebooks will run under those. Um, and we're, we're working on bringing ever more notebooks into these uh, software environments so that you, know, you can just come in and, and shift under. Okay, package fussing aside, um, again, if any folks are having trouble with that, please do put that in the chat um, and we have we have some support that, that uh, can assist. All right, I think I'm actually going to zoom out slightly. Uh, maybe 240% zoom is a bit excessive. To, to dive into today's topic, we're going to be, uh, we're going to start this by, by thinking about how sinusoidal a rotating star's light curve actually is. Now, last time we were pretty wishy-washy about saying, oh, the, the, this Fourier transform will work well enough for us. And it does, but we should consider the nature of the objects that we're studying, right? Stars won't necessarily produce a nice sinusoidal signal. Uh, in fact, we really wouldn't expect that in most cases. Looking at the star from our, our previous example, you can see there's some examples of probably flaring uh, in this data, but also and there's this periodic substructure that's visible. Now, looking at this, you might be able to answer the question, is this strictly sinusoidal? It's not, but let's overplot an actual sine curve just to, just to see the, the, the differences, right? And really discuss what we need in our model. So first thing, it did get the period, right? The, the peak of the blue overplotted wave does actually line up with what I'll call the first peak of the actual signal. So it's not, it's not wrong per se, right? It did find the correct period, but it, it's not quite capturing the complete underlying signal. The, the key characteristics that are different, you know, you might notice there's this, actually there's a secondary peak where you would expect uh, this, this actually where the uh, lowest point of the curve is, where this trough is. Uh, and the actual lowest point, the actual trough is pretty close to the peak, right? Relatively speaking. And so we haven't captured the full complexity of this curve in our model. We also really haven't captured the fact that stars are dynamic objects. So this sine curve, uh, you could imagine, maybe would be sort of appropriate for a particular distribution of uh, star spots that are relatively fixed uh, and don't ever change. But that does not describe stars in general. We would, you know, we would expect over time, some sunspots would fade, new ones would form. And so this, it's kind of this dynamic, quasi-periodic uh, light curve. If you want to read a little bit more about this, uh, there, we, there's a paper that we link um, about this quasi-periodicity of stars. But I think you get the picture, right? This is sufficient to, to say, OK, well, we, you know, our model really actually isn't all that good. So what we're going to do, um, we're going to we're going to begin this um, Gaussian process and and applying it to rotating stars. But to start with, we're going to create a model that actually represents our data. To do that, we're going to use a, a Gaussian process. And the 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 long and and the short of this is that we want to figure out. The, the the covariance between the things that we're looking at, right? So so this Gaussian process is defined by both its its mean vector and a, and a covariance matrix, and we want um, this this covariance function to be able to to create create the the uh, the model for our process, and it's it's 
difficult to, to put this concept into a one hour webinar. And I think the probably the fastest way to get some understanding of what's going on here is to just dive into this without doing too much of the theory stuff. And I, 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 I hate to say it that way, right? There are papers here that you can read, and I, I just think the best way to build up an intuition is to dive into it. Um, so to begin with, we, we do a little bit of data set cleaning, removing all of the uh, not a numbers, removing the outliers, making it just a little bit shorter. Um, it, it'll cut down on the processing time uh, later on. And then shoving everything into a NumPy, uh, NumPy array so that it later uh, can be used by Numba. That's why we've got this float 64 in here. So we're, we're going to dive right into the, this Gaussian process and creating our model. And then maybe we can, at the end of this, we'll, we'll circle back to the theory and, and look at the bigger picture of things. We're going to initialize our model, assuming that nothing is happening. This, this mean function of you, like you can think of this as kind of our, 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 our prior, we're saying nothing at all is happening. There's no astrophysics. This is just a random distribution uh, about zero, a, a Gaussian distribution about zero. We can also add this uh, jitter term so the model can account for white noise uh, that, that might actually be in this uh, system. And we'll again, we're just going to say uh, this is a, uh, a normal distribution. Um, in this case, we've, we've set our uh, sigma for this our, our standard our standard district our standard deviation to be two versus versus ten so order one fifth of the actual uh, in, initial modeling. Okay, so we, we start with saying there's nothing here. There's a little, but there is you know uh, a little bit of noise. What we'll add to the model next are two other terms. So a simple harmonic oscillator term and a rotation term. And the reason that we are doing this is so that we can take into account the, the complexity of the light curve above, right? It's not sufficient just to consider rotation. That, that really wouldn't produce that curve that we see above, especially given what we know about the fact that uh, there's a, a secondary peak after the first one, uh, and then it reaches its, its full, um, it, re it reaches the global minimum, and then it goes back up to the global maximum right after. So incorporating this simple harmonic oscillation term with the rotation term will help our model to be fit more correctly. It also kind of makes sense astrophysically, right? And that's the real motivation for including this is to say, well, I know that stars rotate and also they're usually doing some interesting oscillatory things too, right? Um, lots of stars have different types of rotation patterns and including this in our model just helps us to build a better picture of a star. Uh, so we define um, the the inputs to this. Uh, the again, the rotation term will will tell us about the uh, the star itself, and then uh, we can combine this all together, adding in these these two terms, calculate the likelihood, and optimize the model. So we're gonna we're gonna run the model, we're gonna see what it produces, and then we'll talk about it um, a little bit more. So this this should run in about a minute. Again, I did I did click run all cells when we started this just because uh, as you can see, the notebook is still executing. And so I just want to make sure that uh, we don't run into any uh, any issues where we're waiting for a cell. So this will take a minute. Uh, once that, that comes out, uh, if there's an error there, you can ignore it depending on which version of the package you have. It might not, might not be something that uh, really matters, but let's let's plot this best fit solution against our data. Uh, and it does a pretty dang good job, right, of, of capturing all of these features that I've been talking about. There's an initial peak, there's this secondary peak, there's a global minimum, and then immediately it's followed by the global maximum. And then that pattern repeats in this in this cycle. So this this method does an excellent job of of actually creating a model for us. And and now let's talk about how did it do that. I think it's easier to to step through uh, the that, look at the result, and then come back to this, what's actually going on here. And so what this did, what the code did behind the scenes was, was optimize our, our posterior distribution. And so when we're thinking about this, 
we'll start first by talking about something related to it, which is which is the the likelihood. The most common likelihood function uh, is one that assumes Gaussian errors, and you know, and here's three different Gaussians uh, plotted to, plotted together. But I, I think the real um, sort of meat and potatoes of this concept is this this idea of Bayes theorem that is underpinning this entire calculation, and it's it's actually this uh, equation here. And we're going to do the plain words interpretation of this, and and help to, to break down this concept because Bayesian statistics is is not particularly easy. Uh, most most human brains struggle with this. Um, but in in plain words, the, the, what this equation says is that the probability of the parameters, the parameters that I'm fit right in my model. So this is the rotation term. This is the simple harmonic oscillator term. The probability of those parameters, given the data that we see, is proportional to the probability of the data given those parameters multiplied by the probability of those parameters themselves. And so the, the likelihood is actually the, the second term in that expression, um, the, the probability of the parameters, or the probability of the uh, data given the parameters. And so you can um, substitute it in and see that the likelihood is there. But I, again, I want to come back to this concept. Uh, and for me, it's easiest to think about this in terms of um, the fact that the the probability of the data given these parameters uh, multiplied by the, prob the probability of these parameters themselves sort of makes uh, intuitive sense to me in, 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 the, in the interpretation where the probability of the data given these parameters is sort of like a, well, how well do the parameters fit the data, right? How, how, how well have I actually optimized them to fit this curve? And okay, that makes sense. Multiplied by the probability of those parameters themselves. So if you selected an extremely unlikely set of parameters, right? If you, um, I don't know, if you have a, a like a super large value or you've created something uh, more complicated than it needs to be, right? There's some part of, of, and I guess this comes back to philosophy of science, right? Of Occam's razor saying, well, no, I would, I would prefer a simple solution. Why explain something uh, with a complicated mechanism when a simple one does just as well, you know, there's, there's no reason to reach for complexity when simplicity will suffice. And this is the core concept. So I, I know I've spent a lot of time on this particular thing and we haven't been looking at output, but I, I really do think it's important to understand this. Um, and it, again, at least for me, is not intuitive. Um, but behind the scenes, this is what the code is optimized for us. This is what, um, this is how our model is produced. Uh, again, this, this in orange, um, it by 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 going through this this Gaussian process. Now, the distribution that we were looking at was our best fitting model uh, to identify the the parameters that produce that peak in our posterior. Again, we're we're this is our our best fit um, based on these Gaussian statistics. But we still haven't actually answered the question, right? The question was, how significant is the trend that we have found? Well, all, all I've done is found a different way for us to model this, right? A different way to calculate the, the period of these oscillations. I don't want that. What I want is a, an uncertainty. We want a, an uncertainty that actually is well motivated and we, we didn't have that before. What we can do is statistically sample this uh, this posterior that we've created. So we can explore that likelihood function to figure out exactly how wide that peak is, right? We're not just interested in the peak itself, but in the width of that peak to get our error bars. Now, ideally, you just calculate that, that full uh, likelihood function, right? You just, for all of those different points, you just calculate it. Um, but in a lot of examples, including uh, this astrophysical example that we have, this isn't going to work very well. It's going to take such a long time that you're just going to be sitting around forever. What you can do instead is use a sampler. So it will mathematically efficiently explore the likelihood. Uh, there are many very smart statisticians who have written programs and want you to use their tools to make uh, your science better. So please do use them. Uh, and and uh, again, this this method that we're using will 
sample it in such a way that it, it both efficiently samples, uh, so you'll not spend a whole bunch of compute, but also does, um, doesn't miss uh, important details in the likelihood function. And again, as I said, you don't even really have to think about it. It's actually just built in. Uh, it's a built-in function here. We can use this this fit function uh, to to do it for us. Caveat: uh, It is going to assume that our posterior distribution is a Gaussian distribution, which is fine uh, for our purposes. That's probably that's probably sufficient. Um, but you know, always always think about whether that is justified uh, in this case. So if you run this, um, it, it should come back rather quickly. I don't know if I believe that this ran in uh, a second. I think it does take longer when you run it. Uh, but when it brings back its uh, results, you can plot out a table and look at everything that's in here. It's kind of overwhelming. I think there's a lot of information in here. Uh, but the, the columns, you have the mean and the standard deviation of your parameter, excuse me, that you've put in. The most significant one for us is a log of the period. And, and that's basically what we want to know, right? We, we want to be able to uh, recreate our plots, our, our log log plot of, of period versus flaring rate. And so we've actually got this value right here. And we've got a mean and we've got standard deviation, which is exactly what we were looking for. Uh, there's more summary statistics here, um, which, you know, all of this is detailed below. You can read what all of these different parts of the table mean. Um, but we actually aren't going to use most of these, so we don't need to be too concerned with them. Uh, if we create a plot of this, and again, this is just the same, the, uh, the plot of the sampled posterior distribution, sample of our, of our model space, this is what we get back. And there are a couple of things that <laughs> should uh, jump out at you when you look at this plot. One, our Lomsgargle period estimate was not correct. Uh, it appears to actually be uh, a bit off from the calculated value in this uh, Gaussian process, which which is interesting. The other thing is that this is so broad, right? This this to make a statement that we know the period to be whatever value uh, is pretty inaccurate. I mean, the the spread of this it's not symmetric, uh, so do notice there's kind of a long tail on the right side, and it's pretty steep on the left, um, at least in this log log space. Uh, but even taking that into account, right, this is a spread of a day on the left side and, and you know, maybe two or three days on the right side. It's it's pretty remarkable how broad this is. Um, and this is why this is important. You know, in the last lesson, we did a lot of hand waving and saying, well, it's probably good enough or oh, the chart looks OK. Um, that is not really how <laughs> how science gets done. Um, you know, actually having the statistics to back it up uh, is is important. All right. Now that we've done that for one star, we need to wrap this all up and do it for every single star in our example. The way that we're going to do that is we've we've kind of written this function here. I promise you it is a copy paste of all of the stuff above. There's nothing different. This is still our query for data, reading it in with light curve. This is still, you know, cleaning it up, removing the NANDs, making it, uh, putting it into a NumPy, NumPy array, creating our model. Nothing has changed. I, I, I pinky swear. You can read it all if you want, um, but it will be the same. When you run this, uh, it is going to take you a while. Uh, this this next cell below loads in some of the things you'll need to loop through this. It has all of the, the target stars. Um, it has some of the, uh, the NumPy arrays that are necessary to run. I've actually commented out this cell because, again, it just it takes a long time. Uh, and the backup that is available to you is this all rotation rates uh, dot NumPy, which is a result of basically us running this computation and, and letting it take, you know, the the hour that it that it takes uh, and then saving it. So you can just load it back in. Uh, and that's that's all we've done here. I promise there's no trickery. When you plot this, it is interesting um, to just take a look at uh, 
the the spread of periods. Now, I, I know we we talked about this above, um, and you can see how broad, how well constrained, and how poorly constrained uh, some of these periods are. But in particular, you you can notice this golden uh, this golden one here, right? There, there's definitely a peak in this distribution, which is pretty suggestive, somewhere around the five day mark. But the confidence in this prediction is is not great, right? I mean, it's got just to, to underscore this point, there's a there is a range of periods that could be correct um, up to plus five days about that. Now, it, you know, it's not likely that we have actually have a period over here at 11 days, but we just don't have good enough data to to uh, make a solid claim. And so when we are looking at our final population level analysis, we really need to make sure that our analysis isn't being skewed by any of these points because if this point in golden here if the real value of this is actually nine um and that is pulling our trend in a direction it only takes one two of these points for for a small analysis to begin uh you know dragging it away from a true result not every not every point will be as well constrained as the one on the on the left here all right, so we're going to try to take this into account, right? We want we want this to um, impact our data less. But the problem with this is that the period uncertainties are non-trivial, right? Uh, there's they certainly don't look Gaussian to me. So how do we proceed? And the way that we're going to proceed is with hierarchical Bayesian modeling. We can use this to model relationships between um, different levels of data, um, which, which might have their own parameters and uncertainties. But the benefit of this model is that we can all at once and self-consistently um, infer the, the uncertainties on the rotation rates, and importantly, the uncertainties on the overall trend that is going to describe those rotation rates uh, as they're related to their, their flaring rates. So that is the advantage, is that we can, we can build up this model um, from the individual distributions that we that we calculate. Again, we've already gone through all the trouble of sampling the likelihood from for each of the stars. Uh, and so now we can use this wonderful statistical recipe that is linked to uh, in this paper and also implemented in this paper uh, to to write our code to to begin this hierarchical analysis. Now, uh, here's where the number comes in. Since we have a nested loop, we can get an enormous speed up by using the number package. And it's so easy. All you have to do is throw this at njit at number just in time. Uh, and when you run this for the first time, it will uh, do a, a just in time compilation down to machine code to make the code uh, run that much faster. Uh, in our in our definition here, we're defining the the hyper prior, which what a great name. That sounds, <laughs> I don't know. It sounds very Star Trek, very sci-fi to me. Um, but the, the hyper prior is just the um, sort of system level uh, prior. So we have all of these priors for our different, um, for each individual star. We then have this population level trend, uh, which which is the, the hyper prior. Um, we, we set all of this up uh, below, excuse me, we, can set up our, our Gaussian prior again, uh, somewhat centered around zero, and then we are going to combine this all all together. We will also set up this f rotation function. Um, so this is our population level trend that we want to fit, and this is just a line. So if you recall from last time, we just plotted our points on a log log space, made a plot. Uh, this is our model for that m times x plus b. So just a simple linear equation. This is our, our trend line. Uh, we also, to continue uh, building up this hierarchical sampling, we're going to need to use the previous prior that, that, um, was, that, we, that we created in our individual star sampling. And so we're going to just reproduce what it is that we, uh, that we created above. Um, do note, you want to put this, wrap this in a log um, to, to make sure that you are comparing apples to apples here. The last thing that we have to do 
is compute how likely uh, the the hyper parameters are. And again, that's just our, our best fit for this model. And you can think of that as how likely the trend line for our population would be. We have to calculate uh, the updated prior based on our current knowledge of the population. And we can do that thanks to Bayesian statistics. Each time we add a star in, we can update uh, the, the prior for the whole group until we've built up this uh, knowledge about the entire trend. And so that's what's happening here. Um, that's what this 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 function is doing for us. Now, before we dive into the code in this cell, I do want to take a second just to explain the computation that is about to happen. This is the important part, right? We're, we're going to talk through the logic and then we're going to look at the code and mostly, you're going to trust that the logic, as I have described it to you, has been implemented in the code. This notebook is not going anywhere. Do take some time after this lesson. You know, you the materials will be available, and you can um, you can read through our, our references, read through the code. But we're just going to focus on the core concept of logic of what's happening. So here's the computation. Step one, we've got our list of stars. So we're going to go through all of them and we'll, we'll start with one particular star. So start with one star and look at all of the, um, the period samples that we have, um, available in that data. For each of those samples, uh, we're going to, to calculate the updated prior and the previous prior, uh, for, for that particular period that we've sampled, um, from the, from the posterior. When we calculate the updated prior and the previous prior, we'll take the ratio of those two things, and that results as the likelihood. That's actually the, the, the definition of it, right, is to take the um, updated prior uh, and, and divide by the, oh, I'm sorry, to take the, the previous prior and divide by the updated prior. You might think of this as, as um, dividing by the evidence is, is a common way uh, to talk about that statisticians would talk about this. And the result, uh, again, is the likelihood, that is the definition. So we were able to calculate uh, the likelihood for that particular period sample. Then you have to go through all of those period samples that we have uh, for that particular star. Once you've looped through all the period samples for that star, you go back up to the top, to the top of the for loop, grab the next star, and do the same thing as you work your way through. You can imagine this computation takes a while. Uh, thanks to the magic of Numba, it doesn't take that long. Uh, we, we do trim some of the data out, again, just to make these computations faster, but that is what we, um, that is what this cell here does. So explore at your leisure. Um, I, I, you know, I encourage you to take a look at, at what's been written here, but we are just in the interest of time going to keep moving right along. We have basically assembled all of the difficult statistical machinery, which is great. Uh, now what we can do is actually calculate the posterior of our hierarchical model, which is the thing that we wanted all along. What is the probability of a given trend line given the data? What is the probability of, of a particular trend line given the data? And to calculate it, all we need to do is add the log hierarchical likelihood to the log hyper prior. Man, what a sentence that is. But uh, we're, we're using a bit of logarithm trickery here. That sounds like it, it's, it's something new that we haven't done, but actually adding the, the log likelihood to the log prior um, is equivalent to that multiplication, right? If we, like we talked about earlier, likelihood multiplied by um, the prior gets us um, the, the, the updated, um, our, our updated uh, probability distribution. So when we say that we're adding things, we're just taking advantage of the fact that we're working in log space. Uh, it's not anything new. All right. We are, we are set up now. Um, we're going to 
do a little bit of, of Monte Carlo sampling um, to work through this. The one question that you might have is if we're doing this, okay, so we've set up all of this stuff, we've got our statistical machinery ready to go. We want to figure out what it looks like uh, when we're using different values for, uh, again, since we're fitting the line for the slope and for the intercept. Um, where do we start the walkers? Well, a sensible place to instantiate them would be with a simple regression result. This is the simple regression result that we got last time where we saw a nice linear fit. Um, and, and that is, in fact, the place that you would want to start. You don't want to start too far away from where you think the trend is. Otherwise, uh, you might get caught in a a local minimum of optimization or, or something else, right? It's, it's good to go with the best guess. So this is, uh, I think, actually copy pasted from the previous notebook. It's just recalculating uh, these these values uh, from last time. Now, when we instantiate the walkers, I <laughs> I here have written one thousand steps. This is the incorrect number of steps. You need to do five thousand. The reason I have written one thousand is uh, just in case I needed to rerun this cell while we were talking. Uh, when you actually run this and the sampling has completed, you'll see below that an error is going to pop up. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll cross that bridge in just a second. We're going to check in on those walkers. Uh, and again, the, the walkers in question are particular. I like to think of them as threads. The actual thing that they're called uh, is chains. That's M M C. Maybe should have spelled out this acronym MC, MC, the Markov chain Monte Carlo. So these threads or chains are exploring the parameter space um, and they're doing a random walk. Uh, that's why they're called walkers. So they take a, a random path through the space. And this is the result of that. So the, the, what you should notice, or what I, I want to draw your attention to, is that uh, the slope and the intercept start out at very well-defined values, and then as expected over time, they walk away from uh, those initial values and fully explore the parameter space. Now, um, I did mention that this is gonna be mad at me. We haven't, re we haven't really achieved convergence here. We should probably explore more of the parameter space. So when you run this yourself, if you get this error, uh, you need to make this longer. And in fact, the, the value that will stop this error from occurring is 5,000. Now, I know the last notebook was hand wavy, and I said this time we were going to get down to it, but uh, at least we can very clearly state the assumption that's being made here and, and what it is we're missing. We haven't fully sampled the parameter space, set it to 5,000. You'll get it there. I've run this notebook. I know the answer is the same either way. Do... Do your statistics right the first time. Don't don't do what I'm doing. Uh, and actually, this error is so aggressive that it stops this notebook from running. Uh, so run selected cell and all below, which is good, right? You do want to know uh, when you do this kind of thing. If you uh, get an error like that, you actually probably should stop the workflow and say this has not converged. Do not proceed. Um, so. Uh, when we look at the correlations for this, eh, they look eh, pretty ugly. If we had let this run all the way, they would look much better. Uh, but unfortunately, the slope and the uh, intercept are actually kind of degenerate with each other, which uh, is rather unfortunate, right? Because it means that um, we can produce a, a change in our in our model by tweaking parameters. Um, in, in opposite directions, right? They can account for each other, which is not good. That's that's not really what we want to see. Um, and in particular, I'm referencing this graph here where we're comparing um, the the, uh, the 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 slope with the with the intercept. We really don't want to see that. Uh, knowing that, let's let's go ahead and try to uh, plot. Make a create a plot of uh, all of this in in the plane that we care about, which is the flare rate versus the stellar rotation rate. When we create that plot, um, 
before we talk too much about this, uh, we if you make this plot right away, the, your first thought should be, wait a minute, didn't we spend a whole lot of time talking about asymmetric error bars and uh, the fact that you maybe shouldn't believe um, an error bar in one direction? Uh, and, and yeah, we did. Actually, this is not uh, this is not quite correct. So if we recreate the plot, uh, this is where it's where Seaborn comes in. Um, we we can get a, a more accurate picture of the actual distributions um, on those error bars. What you're seeing in orange are those samples uh, drawn from our slope and intercept parameter space. And so you can imagine it's sort of just randomly pulling out uh, a, a trend line based on how likely that trend line is to occur. Now, two interesting, actually there's a couple interesting things about this, but there's two interesting points on this graph. Uh, and you probably know which ones they are because they have huge error markers on them. They are also, unfortunately, two of the points which are furthest away from the mean. Uh, and that is not good news for the analysis we did last time because it means that the points which were contributing most to the trend also have huge amounts of error on them. And so we really do need to discount them in our modeling. And in fact, just looking at the range of um slopes that we see here they're pretty close to zero which once again is not really good news for our model now uh these these two things were originally exercises there's not there's not time to do exercises this is a pretty complicated notebook so we're just going to proceed right to solutions exercise one what if we just don't model the slope at all what if we just say you know what? What if, what if it's um, we just give it an intercept and we 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 try to plot things uh, in that way? So we say that there's actually no correlation between these two values that we see. We create this new model where we just return the value of b, which we're still allowing to vary. Right? It could be it could be any intercept, um, but we're just not uh, computing the slope. Uh, it does mean we have to kind of rewrite all of our functions. Uh, I promise you again, it's just a copy paste with a couple of, of um, key functions changed so that you can actually run this, but the process is the same. I, I promise again, spend time with this after, uh, if you feel like you really just want to, um, see what's going on here. We're also uh, setting up the walkers. Uh, we can create our plot to make sure that um, they fully explored the space. And yeah, you know, they did They did fine. Uh, this is once again going to spit out an error saying, hey, you didn't do enough sampling and we're going to ignore it uh, because I wanted to be able to run that cell during the notebook uh, demonstration. All right, scroll up, scroll up, scroll up. Oh no, did I click run a cell that was too high up? Maybe I did. Oh, I so did. Oh no. Okay. This is this is why I shortened that one, just in case I did something silly like that. Uh, I also should have pre-executed. Oh, I didn't pre-execute all of the cells over here. Well, past me is really uh really fallen flat on this one. So sorry. <laughs> While this is running, uh, I will go ahead and walk you through um, what it is supposed to be doing. I'm also curious. Did I say restart and run all cells? Oh, that's so tragic. I absolutely did. Okay, that's fine. We'll just talk about what's what's going on um, in these last couple of cells. So, um, roll in. Wow, all of this is running. This uh, exercise one, when it completes, uh, you will see that our trend line actually does a pretty decent job of fitting the data. Um, and, and that should be somewhat um, not intuitive to us, but but based on the based on the plot that we saw, um, I'm also going to run this just in the hopes that one of these notebooks will finish before we run out of time tonight. Uh, <laughs> based on the plot that we saw, right? I, as I mentioned, those two points, the only two points that were really away from just being a, a flat line, also had huge error bars. And so actually when you plot a trend line, a horizontal line does a pretty good job of going through all of the points and their errors. Um, the 
second exercise here, which again, uh, I is I don't know that it's going to finish running in time, but we'll we'll see if I um, if I baked enough uh, hand waving into this for it to actually complete in the next uh, minute or so. But the second exercise uh, is is going to implement something called the the Bayesian information criterion, and the reason why we're doing this is because it's it's one thing to say, well, yeah, sure. I think that flat line goes through all of the points pretty well, but we maybe actually want to consider, is there a way for us to measure that, right? Is there a way for us to actually take into account this idea that I've, I've been hinting at the whole time of, of Occam's razor of a simple model, which fits the data is better than a complex model that fits the data. We should use the simplest explanation simplest model available to us. And mathematically, that is the Bayesian information criterion. Uh, and so it, it is actually able to calculate this um, based on the, the likelihood of the number of parameters and the number of data points, which is just so neat. Please use this in your science. Uh, more people more people need to be thinking about the statistics that goes in that go into their work. If you run this cell, or when you run this cell, the thing that will pop out of this is basically that the value is very low. It's quite close to zero, which tells us, um, and you can read this paper for more details, but it tells us that a trend line is only marginally better at fitting the data than a flat line. And it requires a whole extra parameter to do it. And so this isn't a good description, right? Of a, a, a flat line describes the data as well as the trend line. And basically that's a way for us to say, the trend we found was not statistically significant. Womp womp. So our, our last notebook, we did too much hand waving. We did, we did too much off the cuff assumptions. And even though our result aligned with what we thought, there it turns out that there were really just two data points kind of off centered that happened to skew it in the direction that we were expecting it to. So we did find a real, astrophysical property, but also uh, it doesn't really show up in our data <laughs> when you do statistics. It's not a significant trend. Okay, that is the end of this notebook. I know this was sort of a different flavor. Uh, there wasn't as much coding. There's lots of references, but I, I do think the reason that we did this, the reason that we did a whole, we spent a whole hour of me talking just to disprove our previous notebook, was to get at the this core idea that not only are statistics uh, important, but that you should do them because it's really the only way to get a a good empirical measure of of a scientific analysis that you've done. And if you really do want to do something meaningful uh, and impactful with your research, the best way to do that is to put it through rigorous statistical testing because then you, at the other end of this. Uh, process can be pretty confident in the results that you publish. So I do encourage you to come back to this, to use all of the resources that we link to. It is, it is an important part of the scientific process. With that, uh, congratulations. You have made it to the end of the, of the mass summer webinar. Woohoo. Um, thank you for, for joining. Uh, it, it truly has been a pleasure to, to host you. None of this will will go away. So all of these materials will remain available to you. We're not going to deactivate your account. Pike is not going anywhere. The webinar series is pretty limited in scope. Uh, so if you want to explore the repositories that we have available to you, um, obviously there's things outside of the webinar series. I highly encourage you to check out these other notebooks because they're optimized for the cloud. But I, I'd also like to encourage you to take a look in the references repository, which contains several other notebook repositories. Hello Universe deals with machine learning. Mass Notebooks is phenomenal. <laughs> I, I'm a little biased here, right? I've, I've, I've written uh, quite a few of these and I've updated basically all of them. Um, but there's a wide range of topics in this one uh, from all of our different missions. This platform is, is really designed to do things with tests. So, um, you know, it's kind of best used as a test and another mission, but there's no reason why you can't look at any of these uh, other interesting things. Um, do check them out. Uh, they're, they're all pretty excellent. Um, and 
with that, that's that's all I uh, that's all I have for you folks. So keep keep again. Thank you for coming. Uh, keep using the webinar. Nothing is going away, and it has it has truly been a pleasure to to host you for these. Uh, so so thanks again, and uh, hopefully if we if we do another one of these in the future, uh, I will see you there.